Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Yulia Zoja. I'm with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington University, and I'm joined by my colleagues. Giselle Donnelly. I work at the American Enterprise Institute, along with... Dali Buruhaj. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. If you enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Today we have with us, um, just before the end of the year, Ricard Josbiak, who is the Europe editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Prague, and is here to tell us everything there is to know about Brussels. But we'll start with Ukraine and start broadly, Ricard. First of all, thank you for joining us. And... The first question is about Ukraine and Brussels. We've all been looking at the aid package. Europeans tend to be leaders, tend to formulate these days confidence that they will be able to reach a deal, but not in December, only in January, because it's complicated due to Hungary. However, it seems that beyond the leadership rhetoric, there is a lot of concern in Europe. Is it that the wind is slowly getting getting out of the sails? Is it that Europeans are increasingly, I won't say fatigued, but increasingly fretting about the high costs of the war, about American politics? What's your take from Brussels and, of course, Prague too, in terms of European support for Ukraine? On the positive side, I can say that I am surprised that they've been maintained for so long. And so well. I'm always naturally skeptical with all things Europe because I've covered it for so long. It always, you know, the EU always finds 100 ways to disappoint you. And just when you think you can't be more disappointed, they find a 101st way to disappoint you. But, but I must say, I must give the EU some rare credit. I thought that this. We are not allowed to use that term, perhaps, but that sort of Ukraine fatigue, Julia, that you alluded to, I thought that that would set in actually already last year. When most EU citizens, I would say, realised that, OK, Russia is not going to come storming down our streets and our squares, and we're probably going to survive this winter without any gas cuts or shutdowns, right? So then I thought that already people would just will just not care anymore. And I'm surprised that you know, we, we are now almost a year, more than a year and a half into to this full-scale invasion, and the EU is still delivering. Sure, you mentioned this aid package, but it will come eventually. It will come in a few months' time. They just passed the sanctions package. It's not particularly impressive, nor have the last maybe six packages been, but they still find a way to agree to them. And now they came with that historical, because it is a historical decision. I know there's an inflation in the word historical, but... The very fact that accession talks will start, of course, they're not technically started yet. They will probably sometime in 2024. And that's an interesting bit when they actually will start. It's it's big. And I never thought that that would happen. So in that sense, I'm extremely happy what I'm seeing from Brussels. It's amazing. But, and this is the big but, we are heading towards tougher times. It's clear. I mean... It's not just the election in America next year, it's a European election as well. And I've covered Brussels enough to know that when there is a European election and a change of guards in Brussels when it comes to new commission, commission president, council president, the navel gazing will just get magnified. The EU will just care about itself next year. And that's just a fact. It's going to be the jockeying for positions and so on. We're going to have a new NATO chief as well. And it's going to be, you know, elections in lots of different countries as well. So it's going to get tougher. And Orban, who is the, you know, very much the main character, the, the main sort of uh, bet noir in this story, I think that he's feeling the wind in his sails. And he wouldn't behave the way he's behaving if he doesn't feel that the sand is shifting towards his favor. So positive news, but we're looking into some potentially darker chapters in 2024. Can we peel the Orban onion back another layer or two? You've written, and I've stolen this idea, that Orban is himself changing in the sense that he's becoming more ideological and less transactional. It's more that and, and uh, more aggressive and less reactive to situations. Do you think that's true? And what's going on with him? We in America, he sometimes to some audiences, maybe among our listeners, he appears as a bit of a buffoon 
soon, but you know, there's more reason to take him very seriously these days, I think. I think he is feeling like he's just won the lottery to a certain extent, and he's on a roll. And there are reasons for him to be on a roll, quite frankly. Just look around him. Let's look around in Europe, right? So, and Dalibor knows this very well. His old pal Fitz is back in Bratislava. I'm sitting here now in Prague where I see big, big opinion poll favoring Andrzej Babish, the Czech populist, who might very well return to power in 2025. I see across the Danube, uh, the FPÖ, so the far-right party in Austria, uh, topping the polls. I saw a Dutch shock election where Wilders comfortably finished first, even though he might not actually be the, the, the prime minister in the end, but he will influence that government very much. I see in Poland, even though we we see that you know Tusk was the victor and stuff, but he had to assemble a rainbow coalition in order to defeat a Lord Justice Party that still, after eight years, managed to pull 35% and comfortably finish first there as well. And if you take the far-right vote there, the Confederacy, there's basically 45% that backed them. So it's not sort of like that is an indication as well, right? The, the, the law and justice is still a huge factor in Polish politics, even from the opposition benches. And then, of course... Uh, we see what's happening across the Atlantic in, in America as well, where Trump right now seems to be, what can we say? I mean, there's a toss-up, right? <laughs> that he will end up in the White House. So if I were Auburn, I would have played the long game. And uh, the long game looks very good for him right now. And you will see also in the European election that there will be, I'm not thinking that will be sort of like a populist romp or anything like that, but it will be a rightward shift that suits him, I think, quite well. So, uh, yeah, no, he's tapping into that ideology, and I think that he can feel on the streets, whatever you can say about him, he has the hand on the pulse. And I think the pulse is uh, ticking in a beat that he can sort of enjoy right now. I wonder if you could look back for a second at the most recent European Council that you discussed in your excellent newsletter that everybody should subscribe to. It's called Wider Europe. You'll all, you know, learn useful things about 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 European politics. It strikes me that from you know our Eastern Front's perspective, there were at least three important items on the agenda. So one was the beginning of accession talks with Ukraine, the other one was the fifty billion euro fund for Ukraine, and the third one was the new package of sanctions. And context of all those three decisions, again it's the you know the, the countries of the former Habsburg lands that sort of come to mind as as potential obstacles. So I was I was really struck by the sole fact that Austria's Raiffeisen Bank is still operating in Russia. I wasn't I, I thought they had already left. It is shocking to me, but at least you know a compromise has been been reached on that front. My question for you is considering the sort of hurdles on all these three decisions, would it be reasonable for countries like Sweden and others who are committed to supporting Ukraine, basically regardless of who is currently in power, to try to think more creatively about you know, workarounds, especially if you're now likely to be faced with a coalition of countries in Central Europe that will, you know, give you trouble. Would it make sense that instead of negotiating by default within the EU27 format about the say 50 billion fund for Ukraine, you would have a smaller subset of countries that can actually pony up the resources to just, you know, go ahead between themselves the way it was done, you know, during the Eurozone crisis with the European stability mechanism. Obviously, that doesn't really extend to the accession question or, or to any other sort of subjects where you need EU to act as a collective entity. But I wonder if it could take some steam away from, from the Orban sort of obstructionist train, so to speak. In order for Ukraine to survive in the next year or so, which will be critical, it's about Ukraine's survival right now, I think we have to resort to what you're alluding to, bilateralism and regionalism. There has simply have to be a coalition of the willing, like for example, Nordic Baltic, to to come up with, for example, bilateral military aid or or think about different ways of giving normal aid to prop up the, the Ukrainian government and so on. But then, of course, as you also alluded to, some of the key decisions 
like enlargement, for example, or even these sort of bigger aid packages that need to have an EU budget backstop, in a sense, right? For those things, you need all 27. So while we, in the meantime, to sort of, in a sense, do stopgap things, absolutely bilateralism and regionalism will be the way forward, will be the lifesaver for Ukraine, I think. But sooner or later, the big decisions it's still EU27 and will remain so and it will always be so unless there is a complete change of the treaties, which you need 27 for again. So that Gordian knot, I don't think we can untie. But many countries can get creative on, on short gaps things. Maybe just, just a quick factual follow-up, and you explained this very well in the newsletter. It might be useful for our listeners to understand what the beginning of accession talks with Ukraine actually means. Like, what has the EU committed itself to doing in the next 12 months? And what is a sort of reasonable timeline for, for Ukraine's accession? And, and what are the sort of hurdles that, that, that we can arrive at? Because Orban very famously said after the summit that he'll have 75 opportunities to to sort of throw a wrench in the works in the in the coming years so actually what the eu has done now is just to write down on a paper that they've endorsed that yeah we open accession talks with ukraine this is a but it's not like tomorrow there'll be negotiators in brussels talking about accession it's absolutely not tomorrow and in fact de facto negotiations will probably not be launched until sometime next year. And I cannot be more precise. Kiev is still hoping for March, but this might go all the way till, for example, December next year, a year from now, when talk starts. So basically what they need to do now, first of all, and there's another fight about this, and I don't want to get too much into all the Brussels bubble stuff, but what they need to do soon, and there's hope that they can do that in January, but again, it might be postponed till the autumn, is what is called screening. And that essentially means that the European Commission that will be in charge of the negotiations, they go to Kiev and they meet with Ukrainian officials in all matters and fields and see essentially what this is about is to transforming the Ukrainian law book into the EU law book, right? So you go in all 35 roughly fields, policy field, everything from agricultural to fisheries to economic matters to foreign policy and say, go through the Ukrainian law and say, okay, you need to do this, right? So that is the whole screening process. And that takes can take a year. Ukrainians think they can do shorter. I don't think so. I think it will take a year. And then starts the actual real negotiations, sometimes in 2024, let's hope. But then again, all 27 need to agree in that. And the Hungarians will again probably play some quid pro quo for that. We have to be prepared for that. Okay. You start the talks and then you open chapters. So I said there are around 35 chapters that needs to be opened. There's usually an interim benchmark and then they're closing them, meaning that you have fulfilled all this, right? So it's getting very complicated, but hear me out. So these 30, 75 vetoes he talks about are all these chapters which Hungary and everyone else, by the way, because they can be other spoilers as well, need to do thumbs up. And this process, and this is why I'm, I'm sort of like, it's a fool's game to guess how long this process will take. And, you know, and Ukrainians, they are, and I don't want to diss them now and sort of talk them down and sort of shoot their hope because they are very optimistic that they can get this done in like something, I've heard anything between two and five years, right? That's extremely optimistic. And you should not compare countries, but I will do that regardless. And, and I'm sorry for going on like this, but this is quite important because we need to be realistic about things. I always Always take the issue of Montenegro, right? So a small former Yugoslav Republic that's already is a NATO member that uh, started their negotiations back in 2010. And we are in 2023 now. So in 13 years, they have managed to open all their chapters, but they've only managed to close four, okay? And now you can argue, okay, they don't have the administrative capacity, they have issues and stuff like that. True. But this is a country that is at least twice as rich as Ukraine. They have no war. They have no bilateral issues. They actually already have the euro as a currency. And as I said, they are part of NATO. And yet it has taken this long just to open the chapters, let alone just not even closing them. It's going to take many more years for that. So we are, we are talking about already 13 years coming sort of halfway. So I don't want to sort of say to Ukrainians that guys see you in 2045, but the whole idea about, you know, uh, you've heard about this, that the EU should be ready to accept new members by 2030. That was sort of Charles Michel's came out with this sort of big statement that the council president back in, in September this year. I'll be very surprised if Ukraine 
manage that by 2030. I think 2040 is much more realistic. And now I'm probably already going to start getting hate mail from Kiev for this. But, you know, this is an enormous long process. And even, and sorry for the long rant, but it's also important to remember. This is, in fact, a key thing to remember. Ukraine can do all the reforms they want. They can have fantastic administrators and and officials and everything like that. They follow everything and they implement everything and the parliament implements everything and they pass the law just like they've done so far to get as far as they have. But it takes two to tango. And the EU is complicated. And it's not only the Hungarians. There might be other member states down the line that will say, hang on a minute, I don't agree with that. And they can hijack something in order to get something else on a completely different thing. It can be, for example, I just invent this, but for the Spanish will just say, oh, we don't like our fishing quota anymore. So in order for us to get that fishing quota, we're going to block Ukraine's chapter 23 till we get that. I'm just using that as an example. It's a random thing. But North Macedonia is the main example of this, right? They, they've done so much right in their enlargement process, but still they've been blocked First by Greece for many years, then by France for local election issues, and now by Bulgaria. So I remain, when I talked about in the beginning, that I'm extremely EU skeptic and that they always manage to disappoint me. By my word, will the Ukrainians learn how to be disappointed by the EU? And I hope I'm wrong, but I might not be. Rant over, sorry. No, I think you're right. And and thank you for talking us through what it actually entails, what these chapters actually entail, and that and that it takes, as you said, two to tango. So then, for our majority American audience, I'll quote now, without saying a name, a German MP who was in town recently and who was saying over a talk, was saying, you know what? I think we should be pushing for NATO membership because with the EU, we're not getting any closer. So, Ricard, (laughs) can we turn to NATO now? We turn to the other institution in town. Giselle, yeah. Well, I wanted to draw Ricard out about what the change in leadership in the top two posts may mean. Also, like Ursula von der Leyen has been one of the only EU leaders whom Americans might recognize. So she's, and she's been there for quite some time too. So yeah, Ricardo, just walk us through your expectations about who the candidates are, what who might replace them, and whether it would make a difference in a political or policy sense. Yeah. And, and add to Ursula, our friend here, her rumored possibility of becoming NATO Secretary General. Would that help? Yes, we're fascinated by her. No, but she's a fascinating woman, actually. I mean, I think that to begin with, you know, Madame von der Leyen, to be honest with you, I think she has been impressive when it comes to this whole thing. She she is the European face when it comes to Ukraine, apart from Zelensky himself, of course, you know. So so she's really taken leadership on this. And I think if she wants to, she will have another five years in the European Commission hot chair. How this works is normally that the biggest political group gets to pick commission president, more or less. And I think that, you know, her CDU, which is part of the big centre-right EPP group, I think they will finish top. And I think that sort of she will continue for five more years. I, she's already more or less on a campaign trail, even though she wouldn't say it's a campaign trail, but but she's very campaigny already. So I think she's a shoe in for the commission president job if she wants to and if EPP finish first, which it looks like right now like a half a year till the elections. So in the EU, it's always like this with the three positions. So you have actually council president and then you also have this EU foreign policy guy, the, the HRVP, so the high representative vice president. This is Josef Borrell right now, Spanish guy. So with these three, you always have to have a balance of all sorts of things. You have a gender balance, you have, gender balance, you have to have a north, south, east, west balance, and you have to have a political party balance. So usually liberal, socialist or centre-right or centre-left, centre-right liberal. So that makes it complicated. But let's say that we have a centre-right commission president. That would tell me that we're probably going to get a centre-left council president. And I can think of maybe the current Portuguese prime minister, Antonio Costa, so a southerner there, would also actually, and this is an added value perhaps, and served that Batiste would probably be the first EU leader of colour as well in a, a high position. So that's a plus, I would say. Even though he has sort of certain corruption scandals now that is dogging back in Lisbon but I think you know that he would be able to take that one and then we'll probably have some sort of liberal I guess in the in the foreign policy chair and I am wondering then if that's Kaya Kalas the very outspoken Estonian 
she take that? Well, that's the sort of thing. She would probably take that because she will be the next Estonian commissioner. I'm sure of it. And she would. it would be suitable for her to have some sort of foreign policy role. The question is rather, isn't she a bit too outspoken for such a job that is a sort of consensus job? Because if we know Kaya Kallas well, she doesn't mince her words, you know? So, so that's the sort of thing. Well, isn't that something that they held against VDL as well, against von der Leyen, Michel Michel and all of that, that she's doing EU policy on China and Russia when she is overstepping and but also she's an easterner as well right so she will be very you know and this is the eastern front podcast after all and you know these old easterners they're just warmongers and they, they are so anti-russian so i think that will go against her but she would be of course excellent in that role but again then we came to the nato role as well and i think that and they, they really want a woman there as well the problem is though who would that woman be if it's not von der Leyen nor callas there aren't that many that i can think at the top of my head right now and Mark Ritter the outgoing Dutch Prime Minister seems to really want that job but he would be sort of acceptable for me I think someone that would be very interesting would be the former Latvian Prime Minister Karins Christianis Karins he's very interesting because well he's Latvian American right like it's, it's fascinating when he opens his mouth because he sounds like he's directly from the shores of New Jersey and I think that appeals at least to the Americans you know that they have someone who sort of sounds so American so I have him as my little outside there but that that that's it yeah the romanian president also really wants the job too at nato or any brussels job no this is the thing though because i sort of talked about you know this whole thing about geographical parity in a sense right and and the problem is and this is sort of thing the easterners if you call them that i i hate the term myself i first call the central europeans they didn't get anything last time around so you know they was managed to pick up everything but no easterners got anything Right. So I think they actually, if they manage to find a good candidate, and that's going to be difficult, of course, because it's, you know, there are many different countries that have different uh, viewpoints and ideas of different things. And then there's Orban there as well, of course. So, so it might be difficult, but they really have a shot to get some of the top titles there uh, next year. I mean, there's just so many arguments for why the next Secretary General should be an Eastern European. I mean, not least the fact that it could provide the sort of insurance policy against, you know, Trump's dissing the alliance again. Like if, if if that person comes from a country that actually spends you know two or more percent of its gdp on on on, on defense and and exactly i mean that's the sort of thing like there is especially the baltics that are spending on defense and are sort of doing everything you know? if, I, if i may i was going to ask you in in this context to sort of again, like look across the atlantic to what's happening in the us so there is the supplemental bill which might or might not be passed through Congress, signed into law by the president. There is the specter of of a, of a Trump presidency sort of, you know, lurking in, in the shadows. How do you think both of these things, the sort of short-term challenge and long-term challenge, play in the European context? So say the US does not pass another supplemental bill. Does that really create a sense of urgency around this 50 billion fund in the EU and, 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 and you know, the need to go beyond that? to provide the Ukrainians with what they need to fight? Or will it make it easier for the Hungarians, Austrians, Slovaks to just say, you know, let's not throw more good money after bad and, and stop it? And longer term sort of equivalent of this is this question of, you know, what happens if Americans really start losing interest in Eastern Europe? Like, does it make the EU to really step up? Or shall we see a sort of repeat of the first Trump term in which there was, you know, a lot of talk about strategic autonomy and doing more, etc.? But, but relatively little to show for it. I think there will be some urgency, but only for a short while, because the closer we get to the European elections, the less any country want to do, for various reasons. I think potentially even to sort of make sure that politicians are not triggering their own populace, right? Because there is a question, and there will always be this question, well, you know, and if I was a populist, I would go with that immediately. I mean, why are we sending 50 billion euros to Ukraine when we have a cost of living crisis in our own countries, when we can't pay our nurses or, or kindergartens or whatever you want to say, right? So so that works on this side of, of the Atlantic as well. And I think it's going to work closer and closer as we get to the European elections. I don't think Europe really has a contingency plan in case Trump comes back. I already have a feeling that they are sort of so scared about this that they turn completely lame about it. They just don't know what to do. Because so far, it has been a, a perfect division of labor 
in a sense, when it comes to Ukraine, where the Americans provide most of the military and the Europeans provide most of the other aid, plus taking refugees and help kickstarting this sort of European integration process with, with Ukraine and also take a bit of a financial hit when it comes to sanctions, for example, right? I mean, Europeans take a bigger financial hit than the Americans does because the economies were just much more intertwined with Russia's. So that has worked very well now. And that's a two-track thing. But if one track disappears, the American track, I honestly don't think the Europeans know what to do. And I don't think that they will start spending more money on defense in order to make up that gap. That gap is not really bridgeable for another, I mean, potentially 10, 15 years. They will not spend as much on defense as the Americans have done. They just start from a much, much, much lower base. And then again comes that argument. Shall we spend all this money on military? We can spend on X, Y, Z instead. And that's a very pertinent argument for many politicians in Europe to use right now. So I do have a feeling that, you know, time is not on Ukraine's side when it comes to Western support in general. And if the one of the tracks of the Western support, which is the American track, will diminish or disappear completely. I can see no other way than some sort of settlement with Russia at some point, at least a, a temporary settlement. I was going to push this conversation another maybe darker step. So let's just assume that somehow Trump is elected and American disengagement from Europe proceeds apace. I'm wondering if that doesn't sort of take us back in a kind of Angela Merkel direction where Europeans start saying, well, Russia's at least partly European. We have to live with them. We can't, we don't want to fight them. We can't muster enough weaponry or collective willpower to do so. We should cut a deal not only over Ukraine, but on how to accommodate Russia's quite reasonable geopolitical demands in Eastern Europe. You know, you can take this in a more gruesome direction as far as you want, but it does seem to me that the danger is not merely the, the immediate one of betraying Ukraine, but that Europe will go back in a sort of neutralist direction, or maybe even beyond that. I think it would be also very hard to maintain a, a tough line on China as well. So please tell me I'm crazy to think this. No, I think uh, very much. I had a feeling for a long time, and there are actually some EU officials that sort of uh, whispered this anyway in the corridors. We are probably heading towards EU as an enlarged Switzerland. And I have always been of the opinion from the day the full-scale invasion started that this war is very much about a new Iron Curtain in Europe. And the question really we need to answer is where are we going to draw that Iron Curtain? And there are three possibilities. And this Iron Curtain is already pretty much finished. Like if you look at, for example, Finland building a, a border wall towards Russia, Poland doing that for Belarus. Like Europeans are always laughing about Trump building the wall, right, to, towards Mexico. But it's the Europeans that are actually building walls and barriers of different sorts. Bulgaria to Turkey, for example, so on and so forth. And for me, this war has always been, OK, where does Ukraine fit in? Is it going to be the best Part scenario is it's going to be on the Ukrainian-Russian border. The worst case scenario is going to be on the Polish-Ukrainian border. And the sort of, I guess, most likely scenario, and I hate to say that, will be somewhere through Ukraine. On the Dnipro, yes. And then we'll just have Ukraine as some sort of buffer, right? Like some sort of Berlin, right? In the Cold War sense. No man's land, maybe. And I think that's really what this is about. If you just take it down to the nuts and bolts of what we're seeing in Europe right now, where are we drawing this new Iron Curtain? And no one can answer that question, but I do think it looks likely to be option three. Before we let you go, I'm taking the prerogative of the last questions. The first one is a rather serious one, which is about your, your employer, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. We've had over the last few weeks, first Rim Gilfanov of the Tatar Bashkir service, and then Jeff Gedman, acting president, and Pavel, head of current time and husband of Alsu. And I've also listened yesterday to the press conference of Zelensky yesterday, December 19th, where the Ukraine service that we've had the pleasure of visiting um, when we were in Kiev last year was asking about detained journalists in Crimea and beyond. So tell us a little bit of an update. It is the end of the year. We're looking at 
a very cold winter, including across Russia and where Alsu is being held in Kazan. So what's the date and what's the struggle right now? Well, the struggle continues. The updates are, what can I say, it's, it, they're no good news yet. It's rather grim, I would say, right? I mean, with Alsu and everyone else who remains jailed in Belarus as well, by the way, we are trying our best. There is huge Western support, but we don't... I mean, maybe I'm going a bit outside my remit here right now, but, you know, there is a there is a sense of helplessness, right? I mean, everyone, the EU, individual Western countries, the United States, are working day and night for something to happen, something good to happen for al or anyone else of our many jailed colleagues to come back, to be, be freed. But there's just simply not any good news I can share on that front, I'm afraid, you know, not not at the moment, you know, this is this is a, a very grim message, I'm afraid. It's it seems these are the important parts of what you were just describing, the new Iron Curtain, where it's falling. To me, it's very reminiscent of the worst times during the Cold War and what was happening along these lines. All right, last question. I promise this is a much better one. I have it on very trustworthy and high-level information that you have something to tell us about ABBA and the, the European Commission. <laughs> where are they? Do we have a chance this is also about culture on the eastern front and and beyond do we have a chance as we're looking at the future of european and transatlantic culture to see some kind of a revival of abba <laughs> i'm swedish so uh, so i i can sort of guess where you got that from my my julia how can i resist you uh, on this question but no i mean in the end we are talking about these sort of things as these contests as a winner takes it all contest right but I think there will at some point be a dancing queen in Europe who will very much celebrate the victory of, of a free, whole and democratic Europe. Let's hope her name is von der Leyen and that someone in the Kremlin will face his very deserved Waterloo. That was really well done. Wow. I see. So this was just a, just a game of puns. Very well done. But I, I thought you would make the announcement that Annie Fried Linkstad would be considered for the position of commissioner for the European way of life. I think she would, she would do an excellent job. Why, why don't you just take a chance on her? You know, that's the sort of thing. <laughs> this is great. Maybe we can get an ABBA tune in. <laughs> now no, I'm done with my ABBA discography. You know, that, that's about what I can. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. We always try on this podcast to end on a positive note and you actually made us laugh. So this is great. Thank you, Ricard, for joining us so much from me, Julia Joja, and my friends. Giselle Donnelly and Dali Burohaj. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. To stay up to date with The Eastern Front, please give us a follow on X at Eastern Front Pod, one word, and sign up for the newsletter included in the show notes. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AI.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>